Also from Ireland is past guest Sandra Higgins. Uh, when we last spoke to her, she was talking turkeys at Christmas. This time, we brought her in to discuss International Respect for Chickens Month. Welcome back, Sandra. Give our listeners a reminder of who you are and the work you do at Eden Sanctuary. I founded uh, Eden in 2008. It was the first vegan sanctuary in Ireland, and it's now home to approximately 100 residents, uh, farmed animals, and it's also attached to a vegan education centre and to a psychology practice. And the psychology practice, the whole focus of the psychology practice now is on veganism. May is International Respect for Chickens Month. What is the history of this and why is there a need for such a month? Karen Davis is the originator of International Respect for Chickens Month and, and May the 4th is International Respect for Chickens Day. Karen runs United Poultry Concerns in the USA and she's done tremendous work to highlight not only the atrocious lives of birds who are used by humans, but also to highlight their beautiful natures and their individuality and their intelligence and the wonder of their lives when they're not exploited by humans. So Karen's message for International Respect for Chickens Month is for people to be vegan. And it's a message that I share with her. The work I do at Eden is my effort, uh, not just to give a home to the few animals who are fortunate enough to, enough to be rescued from human use, but to play my role in creating a world where we no longer use other animals for any reason through vegan education. So I feel that I kind of act as the animal's messenger to the world by bringing their histories and their personalities and their stories to light. So to celebrate this International Respect for Chickens Day, we released a video and it was footage of a rescue that I did in 2012 from enriched cages. And I released it to, to highlight the harms that hens suffer when we use them for eggs. And we've also released a video on the other, the other side of the coin, a video that was produced by artist Roisin Mooney that celebrates their liberation when they have the opportunity to live at a vegan sanctuary um, at, at Eden where we don't view them as property and we don't, use their, we don't view their eggs as food for humans. So we, we were speaking about George Monbiot's recent article on chickens earlier in the show, but uh, could you describe what industry exploitation of the chickens would typically look like? dreadful it's dreadful and 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 it's across the board it's not just factory farming it's the chickens of eden they come from a wide range of of, of rescue situations so they come from free-range situations organic farms and a lot of them from what people regard as the most humane of all the uh, the backyard or the smallholder chicken keeping in fact some of them actually come from from other rescues the kind of illnesses that they they suffer of course if they come from the cages they're in a really bad state when they come here because of the terrible confinement they also suffer because of conditions that where levels of hygiene are very poor where they where they don't have enough shelter they don't have adequate fencing or housing and they don't have decent nutrition and the type of preventative care that they need. But also the very fact that they're bred to lay eggs in unnatural quantities. In the wild, they lay one or two clutches a year just for the purposes of, of rearing their young. Whereas when they're bred to lay eggs, they're, they're laying hundreds of eggs a year, laying eggs in, in, in very unnatural quantities. And because they're bred into bodies to do this, their health is severely compromised. So they have... A, a range of illnesses. They have like osteoporosis, so they get a lot of fractures. They're very prone to different types of cancer, notably at uh, reproductive cancer. I mean, the rate of reproductive cancer when they're when they're about nine years of age, they will all they will all probably die of, of reproductive cancer. So we see things like uh, prolapses. They like like a woman who has have a human woman who has too many children. Uh, they have uterine prolapses. They are very prone to infection, so E. coli, salmonella, but a particular type of in infection called peritonitis that happens when something goes wrong in the process of laying the egg and it's laid internally and some of the egg yolk material stays inside. And uh, it's, it's an infection that's fatal unless it's treated immediately. And even then it compromises the, the, the health and the well-being of the chicken. We see a lot of respiratory infections which are very serious because in a chicken, in, if we got a respiratory infection, it wouldn't go through our whole system generally. But in a chicken, it, c it can go right through our system and affect her reproductive functioning and the glands that makes the shell. And of course, once that malfunctions, then she's left open again to things like peritonitis because if she doesn't have a proper shell on the egg, some of the egg yolk material can escape inside. But one of the things that we see very frequently at Eden is ascites. And that's when the body fills with fluid in response to cancer. 
um, maybe heart disease, liver disease or infection. Humans also suffer ascites and it's you very often hear of somebody in the late stages of cancer with something like ascites and, and, and it's very, very troublesome. I've seen x-rays of, of hens with ascites and there's so much fluid that it compresses the intestines so, and, or the crops so that they can't eat and it compresses their lungs so they can't breathe. So we regularly would uh, have, to, have to drain them with a, a syringe and needle. That's just an overview, I suppose, of some of the suffering that they go through. Could you share some reflections on the individual chickens who have come to share your life over the past few years? Yeah, well, I suppose Verona maybe comes to mind because we, we, had, we had a lot of illness uh, this year and Verona was one of the last, last chickens to die. She was rescued from... She was, uh, she was actually in that video that I spoke about uh, that I released for International Respect for, for uh, Chickens Month. She was rescued from an enriched cage in 2012 it's very difficult for me to get my head around the fact that Verona's gone because she just had such a wonderful, very strong personality and everybody who came to Eden loved her. She was very popular with interns and volunteers because she was so curious and friendly. She'd, she'd jump on their shoulders while they were cleaning her house and she loved to eat her own eggs so she was able to crack her own egg and she, and she had always eaten it before we got to the house and that was one of the reasons why she was so special to me because today farmers used to kill, or they all, they do, they kill the hen who eats her own eggs in case she teaches the other hens to do the same. So it's, you know, it's so different at Eden because we don't view the hens and we don't view their eggs as, as our property. and we, we give them their own eggs or they can do what they like with, with, their, with their own eggs. Another hen that, that uh, comes to mind is Frida and Frida's story always, uh, haunts me. It will, will always haunt me. She was rescued from an enriched cage also, but, but by another rescue, and they sent her to Eden when she had hurt her leg. And she was x-rayed and found to have a, a really severe fracture, a comminuted fracture in, in her hip, and also evidence of, of several fractures that she had uh, it was suffered while she was in the cage, so untreated and they healed when she was in the cage. And she also had profuse bone can- cancer. So what, what horrified me was the fact that she was carried out of that rescue, out of that uh, cage, upside down by her legs. And when she came to Eden, she, she was chirping and she was breathing with her mouth open. And she, was, she was obviously suffering so badly. So, you know, that, that, that always haunts me. Then we have, uh, we have Margaret who lives in the house with us. Margaret was given to me by a child who over a period of two summers gave me a few of the hens that he was keeping in his back garden for eggs when, when they had, they were still laying eggs, but they had slowed down. So I engaged him immediately in, with vegan education. And it was when he came back the second summer and I explained to him in detail how the male chicks are killed in the egg industry that I think I really got through to him. And I gave him a lot of literature that he could give his mom on, on how to replace eggs in, in cooking. And he's never come back since. So I, I hope that he has stopped keeping chickens. But Margaret wasn't always blind. He came home from school one day and uh, found she couldn't, she couldn't find her way into the house. So she possibly had a head injury. But uh, she can't manage to live outside. You know, if it rains, she couldn't find her way into shelter. She wouldn't have to find her way into the house at night and she wouldn't be able to find her way to her food because so, we, we tried to keep her outside and, and we couldn't. So she lives indoors with us in a huge dog kennel um, and she has some sight she can see shadows so as long as we leave her food and her water in a consistent place she, she manages fine and she can live outside in the same kind of a, a facility during the summer but one where she has access to the grass and she gets very excited if you go near her she chirps very loudly and very excitedly and, and she loves to be to be uh, cuddled uh, she, She's a, she's a lovely little girl, but she really, really struggles to lay eggs. And when you see Margaret laying an egg, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is a woman, a human woman in childbirth. It, it obviously hurts her and distresses her, and she requires really high doses of calcium supplements and, you know, calcium-enriched foods. But, uh, you know, otherwise she, she's very happy. So I could go on. You won't be able to stop me talking <laughs> about the, the individuals. We have Maria, who's the smallest hen at Eden. She was part of an open rescue a couple of years ago from a small holder who, who, who kept a group of chickens, group of chickens and other animals 
in, in a shed and, and they were the shed was away from his home so he only fed them once or twice a week and the night she arrived one of her toes had been amputated so she still suffers with that on a very cold day her, her foot trembles but despite the fact that she's the smallest hen at Eden she has a really loud voice and she can hold her own with with any of the larger hens and she gets on really well with everyone so she follows me every morning because she knows she'll get a, a treat just outside the the turkey's gate <laughs> and then I suppose Matilda because Matilda was my first awakening to, to what I, I think of as the personhood of chickens because she was we thought she was an extraordinary hen now that I know a lot of hens I think she was less extraordinary than I thought at the time but she still was very special so she used to fly out of the sanctuary and when I'd come down in the morning she'd be outside the kitchen window waiting for me and she used to come in the kitchen window and sit on the back of a chair while I would be getting the lunch ready and hang around the kitchen. She seemed to love human company and she knew where the bread was kept. So she would uh, stand at the bread drawer and keep pecking at it until I opened it to give her a slice. So I was distraught when she died because she was one of the first deaths that uh, I experienced at Eden. And I promised her that night that I would devote the rest of my life to telling the world about, about chickens, who they are and how precious they are and how their lives are so precious to them and, and what we destroy when we use them for something that, that we don't need. So I set up the education centre after that because I realised, you know, while rescue is wonderful, it is very special and important for the individuals who are here, who are here uh, vegan education is actually more important. So I called it Matilda's Promise in, in view of that promise that I made to her that night. So you spoke of open chicken rescues and we discussed the Dublin lobster rescue earlier. Have you felt pressured mm. to present a spectacle to the media in order to get the stories of your residents heard? I have, yeah, I have on occasion, on a few occasions, but I haven't, I haven't followed them up. You see, a lot of what happens at Eden has to be kept uh, confidential. So something that might make a great media headline wouldn't necessarily attract the right attention here. And, and the right attention... Uh, for Eden, I think, is is on the animals. So it's on their lives and their personalities and their histories and their relationships with each other and with their human caretakers. And it's on vegan education. So it's not sensationalist rescue and it's not about the humans who rescue them, not at Eden. It's also not about abuse or poor treatment. The only criteria needed for an animal to come to Eden is that they're being used by humans usually for food, and they're facing slaughter. So it's not about indivi those individual awful isolated cases that we read about of awful animal cruelty. It's about institutionalised cruelty that's attributable not to a, to a deviant personality or to one individual, but to the ordinary person walking the streets who's eating the same thing, wearing the same thing, using the same shampoo as everybody else on the street. So that's, that's the criteria for rescue here. And that doesn't necessarily make good headlines. The media really are they're interested in sensation and the excitement of rescue. But really, when I, when I have the opportunity to rescue an animal, the very last thing that's on my mind is to remember to contact the producer or the journalist who reminded me to contact them. All my attention's on the well-being of the animal who's been rescued and arranging transport and preparing a place for them at Eden and making sure that they're okay when they arrive here. Now, I'm very happy for the media to visit Eden to talk about the lives of the animals post-rescue, particularly the degree of care they need because of the suffering we inflict on them and also to showcase their individual personalities and how they live at Eden and how they get on with each other. And I'm very happy to discuss the vegan education aspects of Eden's work, but they don't make uh, good headlines, so that's not where my energy goes, really. So, Sandra, what did you think about the uh, lobster open rescue? Well, I think what's most important when we rescue other animals is our intention. So... I can empathise with anyone who passes a restaurant and bears witness to lobsters that are kept in a confined space with their claws tied and in filthy water, especially knowing that the awful death that they face. And I empathise with the terrible emotional overwhelm that activists feel in these situations and their desire to alleviate the lobster's suffering and, and prevent their awful deaths. And I'm also aware that people who, who are critical of the rescue were defending the, the lobster fishing industry and they were fearful of bringing disease into the lobster habitats that they profit from or damaging the reputation of the restaurant 
or fearful of act- activists who remind diners in restaurants and remind the public of their moral obligation not to boil someone alive. But I think that uh, I think these kind of rescues can be used as an opportunity to do vegan education. And for me, that's the most effective aspect of our work as activists and rescuers. You see, for the most part, people are not aware that many other items in restaurants that they regard as food might also have been boiled alive. So chickens and pigs are regularly uh, put into the skull tanks in slaughterhouses while they're fully conscious. This happens every day of the week. Uh, no animal can be killed without suffering, and n- not one single one of them wants to die. So there are other products in restaurants and supermarkets that are equally exploitative, and it's just important, as important, I think, to educate the public about the suffering behind eggs and dairy. You know, for example, in vegetarian restaurants that have a more ethical reputation uh, as it is to let them know about boiling you know, that boiling lobsters alive is unacceptable. So, like, I can speak for myself and I can say that um, what I do at, at Eden is I continually examine my, t- my intention and I try to be aware of my motivation in my work. So when I rescue someone or when I take in a resident that another activist has rescued, I do my best to meet their needs by ensuring that I have place and that I have sufficient resources to care for them not only at rescue, but into their future, because they'll spend their entire lives here, several years, you know, as many years uh, as possible, we hope. So it's very difficult to say no when somebody needs a home, but sometimes I have to say no, because I can't rescue everyone. And if I rescue someone without having adequate resources to care for them, then that rescue is about me and my suffering at knowing that their suffering is unrelieved rather than being about them and being able to offer them a life that is worth living at Eden. So that's just, I'm just speaking from from my perspective and and how I try to to manage Eden and my thoughts and my emotions about the work I do. And so with respect to the release of the lobsters, because I know that was one of the things that people were very critical of, the lobsters were, were released in Clontarf. See, I don't know how well structured or studied that release was, but what I think is even if it was not ideal. I think we should keep the focus on educating the non-vegan world. And I'd like to think that we could accept that we all have different ways of approaching the same goal, but we share the same goal. And that goal is is a non-vegan, violent world. Chicken individuals are exploited on a larger scale than other species. This episode touches on overdevelopment, overpopulation and overshoot as per the title of a new book. How many chickens are used and killed per year and what are projections for future demand? Well, over 70 million are killed for their flesh in in Ireland every year and millions more are killed in the egg industry and of course millions of male chicks are also killed in the egg industry and I think worldwide the estimated number of chickens is about 70 billion and the consumption of egg and chicken in Ireland rises every year it's actually one of the highest in the EU and I think that this might be fueled by the myth you know the humane myth because we nearly even don't need to advertise happy products in Ireland because you just stick it you just stick the label Ireland on it and people have absolute confidence that the animals are not harmed but I think it's also fueled by reports on the association between red meat and, and processed meat and, and human illness like like cancer and also the kind of nonsense that's peddled about weight loss on diets that are high in animal protein and low in carbohydrates. To be honest, I tend not to get that bogged down in statistics because for me, if one chicken is being used as, as food, it's one too many. You know, you've, you've mentioned the title of overdevelopment, overpopulation and overshoot. You know, one of the problems is that the human population is growing. And Irish agriculture, uh, I'm sure animal agriculture in all countries, they, they see this as, as a wonderful opportunity to profit from the lives of, of animals. And the view for Irish agriculture by 2020 is really appalling with the very significant increases in the numbers of exploited animals. We're already the fourth largest beef exporter in the world. And one in seven babies worldwide are fed the milk of Irish cows. And the goal by 2020 is to feed one in five babies with infant formula produced from the milk that belongs to the the Irish cows and, and their calves. And this is despite the fact that we know that human children benefit most from breastfeeding to the extent that we in Ireland don't allow infant formula to be advertised to Irish parents. It can all be, only be advertised at a later stage in the form of follow-on or growing up milk. And yet the industry has no compunction about advertising um, infant formula in China, which is a country that didn't even traditionally 
consume dairy products. And now that China is curbing the advertising of infant formula, um, Irish producers are fearful that the ban will affect our our exports or or that they'll be fined for breaching advertising standards. I mean, the whole thing is just so short-sighted because given all the evidence we have about how unnecessary it is to use other animals and how harmful it is for us and for them and for the environment, the projections for Irish agriculture are unbelievable, like a 50% increase in milk production by 2020 with the abolition of the EU quotas. So I I sometimes feel that, you know, we're living in alien worlds. It it just doesn't make any any sense because I think, I hear a lot of people saying that veganism is not easy. I think it's very easy, you know, particularly for people living in the Western world in Ireland. It's very easy to be vegan. And it just, it's just a a small change to our lives and a, a very small cost to us that gives us huge benefits that gives huge benefits to our children, gives huge benefits to the environment. Like we, we could we could stop the destruction of our environment. We could even pull back from, from our, our gallop towards the destruction that we're facing through climate change. And it, for such a tiny change, I mean, if you could just come and witness what rescue does for the animals at Eden, for su- such a tiny change in our life can give so much joy to them and such a tiny change can prevent such devastating suffering. Hello, I am the vegan Simon Amstel. You are listening to the Species Barrier. Occasionally spent hens who are no longer profitable to the industry will be made available to new homes rather than killed. How do you feel about payments to farmers and the rescuers who then consume or sell the chickens' eggs? The short answer is that paying farmers for the animals we rescue means that we're paying into the industry that exploits them. So people who rescue hens and then consume the eggs are perpetuating the notion that eggs are food. And as long as eggs are viewed as food for humans and not as the potential young of chickens, or in their unnatural quantities as the result of human interference in an exploitation of, the, of, the, of their reproductive systems, then we'll always have exploitation, and we'll always have suffering. And for people who are hung up on factory farms, we'll always have factory farms. But I do realise that people who pay farmers for the hens believe that what they're doing has value for the individual hen who, 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 who they save from slaughter. And of course, from the perspective of that individual, I can, un- I can understand that because I know these individuals from no, I, because I, you know, I have such an intimate relationship with these hens at Eden. But I think there, you see, there are times when it's impossible to persuade a farmer to give an animal away because he, you know, he views that as suffering a lot. But I think we should, all, we should make every attempt to rescue without compensating the people who exploit them. Then I know there's the other thing. Some sanctuaries are so stuck for funding that they sell the hen's eggs or, or the sheep's wool or whatever. And I can also empathise with that shortage of funds because it's very expensive to run a sanctuary or a rescue. And I remember what it was like at Eden before we had sufficient funds and we, and we constantly require funds. But, it, but I would say that there are other ways to fundraise that don't contradict the vegan message and don't compromise the animals that we rescue, that we claim to advocate for. And I think that, you see, the problem with that, the kind of situation that you've, you've, you've talked about there, um, paying for rescue, there definitely seems, I, I have seen a pattern in Ireland, there seems to be an agreement between some rescue groups and some egg farmers on an ongoing basis, which is very unsavoury. And the farmers are being paid significantly more by these rescues that they, than they would get at the slaughterhouse. So I think if we're on the hen side, it's immoral to give money to the people who have a vested interest, interest in, in exploiting them and their comrades. So after the rescues pay the farmers, then they go on to sell the hens to somebody else for five euros. And they claim that they need, that they need this money because, you know, they had boxes and transport and they fed the hens or whatever. But, you know, it's another form of profit. So if, it, if you're profiting from them, you're not rescuing them. And then before the hens arrive at their final home, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at this series of transactions, you see that a lot of profit has been made from their lives. And one of the worst aspects of, of this rescue is that they can be sold from place to place, which is exceptionally disconcerting from them. Because I, I know at Eden they have, they have a sense of place, the same as we have a sense of place. And like a very high up on the list of human stressors is moving home 
it's, it's the same for hens. And some of the friends of Eden, some of the, the, the supporters of, of, of Eden have described for me that these transactions and, and, and the exchange of hens and money, it takes place on roadsides all over Ireland. You can read in, in, in our free newspapers, they regularly run, run ads stating that there are hens for sale who've been, who've been rescued from slaughter, from these egg farms, but they're, they're not ads advertised as rescued hens who now have a right to a decent home. They're advertised as producers of so-called free-range eggs. So at every step of the way, this rescue is more about the, the humans and the benefits to the humans than it is about the rights of the hens. And then, of course, a lot of the hens end up uh, living with people who, despite having the best of intentions, and I'm sure they do have the best of intentions, but they don't have the knowledge or the expertise to, to care for them. And this isn't helped by the fact that the hens are advertised as having no needs. So I've seen adverts selling the hens that state that they require only a small space, like a dog kennel for shelter and something to eat or drink. And anybody who takes an interest in the lives of hens know that they, they need so much more than this because, you know, they have complex needs and uh, they have huge, the huge range of illnesses and they're very fragile and they have a very short lifespan. So, uh, you know... Keeping them well takes a lot of time and energy and money. So what are the needs if we're talking about respectful care for a rescued hen? Actually, I'm working with Gabe Bradshaw from the Curryless Institute at the moment. We're writing on a paper on rescue and recovery of traumatised hens, you know, traumatised from human use you know, in the meat and egg industry. And that paper will, will outline the needs for, for good care. So they need, they need space, like confining them in a small house with one of those tiny runs attached to it is just putting them in another another prison. So they need a secure house. They need perches that are not too high. Uh, they preferably need a soft floor, like a, a wooden floor, because they, they they love to jump, you know, but they have osteoporosis, so they, they, they break their bones very easily. They need nest boxes, and they need to be filled with something soft, like, you know, like wood shavings. Um, they need to be cleaned every day. Uh, they need a space to roam and, and forage because they haven't lost the instinct of their of their wild ancestors, the jungle fowl. They need high quality food, and um, I would say to people, make sure there's no fish meal in in the chicken food. They need fresh grass and grit to stop them having impacted crops, which is another disorder that's that 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 occurs very frequently. Um, they, they usually need calcium supplements because they lose a lot of calcium. When in, in, in laying the eggs and that that's get leached, leached from their bones and that's what causes the osteoporosis and also affects the quality of the shell. So they need to be treated for internal and external parasites every three months and the houses need to be cleaned out and sterilised a, a couple of times a year um, in order to prevent parasites and to uh, prevent reinfection and they also need to be cleaned out if, there, if there's an outbreak of illness. And when they become ill, which they do, they all become ill, they all have very short lifespans, then they need pain relief and appropriate veterinary care. And that, and that veterinary care is very expensive. So veterinary visits and assessments like x-rays are expensive. And then the treatment is expensive because hens have a very high metabolic rate. So they require the same dose of medication as large dogs. And they have a very high rate of illness. So, you know, if you if you think about all those illnesses that I mentioned earlier on, so that's that's a lot of energy. It's a lot of time. It's a huge emotional drain on the humans caring from, for them. It takes a lot of money. Most people engaged in these kind of rescues are not prepared for that. We also need to respect their relationships with each other. So people often come to Eden and they hear me, you know, the di- dilemmas that I have, like maybe somebody died, maybe one of the males died, or maybe one, a female's left on her own, or a male's left on his own with no females, and they say, why don't you just move somebody in with somebody else? You can't just pick them up and, and move them, because they have social networks and relationships, you know, really um, the same as us, the very same as us. Like, at Eden, a couple of months ago, a, a duck, Geraldine, had a, a, a very bad leg injury and so she had to live on her own away from the male ducks in, in with the chickens and her friend Gina wouldn't go to sleep at night until we let her in to the house with Geraldine so you don't always see the relationships and the bonds they have each, with each other but you have, to, you have to watch out for those things and respect them and respect their space and, and, their, and their preferences. So I would say that I, it's not that I'm against these kind of rescues in general, you know, back, backyard rescues and giving, you know, for a group, for a sanctuary to go in, 
say like Animal Place in the States have done. They've gone in, they've rescued, and, but they haven't paid for the chickens, and then they've rehomed them uh, to people who care for them. On the model of the micro-sanctuary movement, that's a wonderful thing to do. It's a great way to break the species barrier and make con- a connection with these wonderful beings who are usually seen as food. But people need to do the research. They need to reach out to somebody like me. And as, as I did in my turn, I reached out. I still do all the time reach out to sanctuaries who are more experienced than me. And be prepared to give them the care they need so that when, they, when we rescue them, that they don't suffer even more because of our ignorance. Uh, and they are, I would say that the egg-laying hens of Eden take more work than virtually any other animal. But uh, they're, worth, they're worth it. They're worth every bit of it uh, and more. So what are the latest goings-on at Eden? A lot, <laughs> actually. So we've, uh, we've expanded and we now have an extra six acres. And that meant we were able to offer a home to some new residents. So we have Krishna, a lamb, uh, whose mother died. And I got Krishna, Krishna the, 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 the day he was born, within hours of his birth. And with him, uh, you showed a, 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 an, old, an older sheep, a much older sheep, a very skeletal little girl, very traumatised. She had lost her twin lambs. Um, actually, you showed it was due to be slaughtered, but when the farmer discovered that she was pregnant, he spared her. So that they came from the, sa- the same farm, and they were, they were both very ill in different ways when they arrived. And uh, you, you showed her now has lost all her, all her wool, um, but she is recovering. She's putting on more weight. And Krishna's, Krishna's great. He follows me around everywhere. He, he, he stays on me while I'm doing my rounds in the sanctuary every day. And then after that, we took in two more orphaned lambs, Holly, who's blind, and uh, her friend, Ben. Uh, so these are, these are all rescues um, that we've been able to do just by persuading the farmer to give us the animals. We don't, we, don't pay, we don't pay for them. And that in itself is a form, a very useful form of vegan education for, the, for those people. We also have another arrival. We, we have a very strict no breeding policy at Eden because, you know, resources are tight and we, we keep our resources for rescue instead of bringing new lives into the world. But for a period of time, we were, we were kind of plagued by some dogs who kept coming into Eden? Not, not. It wasn't their fault. That the, the, their the, their guardian didn't uh, keep control over the situation, and they kept coming up here. And they did a lot of damage. They killed a lot of uh, sheep and lambs in in the in the surrounding fields, and uh, chased a lot of sheep up to Eden. So on some of those occasions, there were male sheep at Eden, and a couple of months later, Willow had five. So she was unexpected. We didn't plan for it, and, and, and we wouldn't have planned for it. But now that she's here, we, we, we adore her. But we, we only adore her a fraction of, of the adoration that she gets from her mother. It's been a wonderful opportunity for us, actually, to, to witness again that beautiful bond between mothers and, and their children in other species. And it brings home the dreadful damage that we, that we do when we consume dairy products. So uh, all their stories are on uh, um, on my blog on on the website. You can you can look at them and there's some lovely videos of, of the interaction between Sive and Willow shortly after Sive's birth. And because of our expansion, so we're hiring a sanctuary assistants. So that's a salaried position from somebody who who can do the heavy construction work and sanctuary maintenance work that I'm not able to do, as well as to help out with some of the animal care work. So I've also um, had a couple of new vegan education projects that are that are proven very effective. Actually, the, probably the most effective, really, is the volunteer and internship program that we have, where people come and live here for a month or longer, and they offer their skills to care for the residents or work on the sanctuary, and they immerse themselves in, in a, re- a residential vegan education program while they're here, the most important aspect of, of which is the interaction with, with, the, with the animal residents. And over the years, all but one single person has gone vegan, which is wonderful. And I'm also giving some um, workshops and doing some film screenings at our, yoga, our local yoga centre. So that's, um, that's been effective. The numbers are still very small. They're still very small, but, you know, we're hoping that more and more people will become interested And I'm also giving online workshops to mindful eating and living groups in the UK. 
um, they're, they're very successful because they can be given to any group of people as long as they have an internet connection and a decent sized screen and they can be tailor made to groups who just want a vegan education, a general vegan education or to a more cl- clinically oriented group like a mindfulness group who want to explore like how compassion and mindfulness are at their essence about the non-violent philosophy and lifestyle of veganism. And then there are several groups and individuals in Ireland as well as in uh, New York, Germany and in parts of the UK that are using the vegan literature that we produce at Eden in their activism. So they're all, they're all people who have an intimate knowledge and connection with the residents at Eden. So they're able to hand out the literature, but they're able to back it up with the stories of the lives of the residents here because they're, they're interested in them and they follow them or they've met them. They know their stories very well. Not everybody feels able to do street activism. You know, a lot of people are too shy to do that kind of activism, even though it's brilliant activism, but a lot of people are, don't feel able to do it. So, for instance, I always keep these brochures in my bag, and every time I get a chance to engage somebody in conversation, I give them a brochure, and one of the friends of Eden left some literature at her doctor's surgery in New York this week. So you never know when or where you'll plant a seed that helps somebody to go vegan. So, if, you know, if people are, if any of the listeners are familiar with Eden's residents and, and they would like some of our literature, I'd be very happy to, to share it with them. So whether to get the information or request literature from you or to give a donation to help with your running costs, what would be the website they should go to? It's uh, EdenFarmAnimalSanctuary.com or they can email us at EdenAnimalSanctuary at Yahoo.ie. Is there anything else you'd like to say that we haven't mentioned? I'm sure most of your listeners, if not all of your listeners, are vegan. But if they're not vegan, what I say to people is life is short. Um, don't waste any more precious time. Do the research and reach out, get help from somebody like me or some of the wonderful organizations that are out there and, and make the connection with other animals and go vegan.